from about 1850 to 1864, the Taiping Civil War or the Taiping Rebellion ravaged China and resulted in the deaths of 20 million or more people. Now, this stat gets thrown around a lot in reference to this event, but from a human perspective, looking back on the past, it can be difficult to fully comprehend what an event that leads to the death of 20 million people actually means. In fact, it's probably impossible to fully understand what that means, but we can try. I want to start off by reading a couple of accounts from the time period that simply describe what people in China were seeing and feeling during this Taiping Civil War. One newspaper in China summarized their region's experience of the war by saying, quote, In 1860, the rebels penetrated the border of our department, coming and going countless times. Many of the inhabitants suffered and were killed, or killed themselves, or were captured, or starved to death, or died in epidemics. Those that died totaled more than half the population. Those that lived had no way to support themselves, and all were driven out to the fort in the southern countryside. The fort protected them from danger, as it was easy to defend. The rebels attacked several times, but failed to capture it. But when a rebel detachment, led by Hong Rong Hai, broke through the walls and captured the fort, his men carried out a cruel massacre. None of the residents survived. Between 1860 and 1865, the people could not farm, and so they ran out of grain. In the mountains, all of the wild plants were consumed, and people ate each other, which led to the spread of epidemics. There were corpses and skeletons everywhere. The roads were covered with scrub, and for several dozen li, there was no sign of human life. This was a strange disaster, unprecedented since the beginning of human existence. End quote. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that's just one account from a Chinese perspective, maybe a little bit exaggerated, doesn't tell us the full story. Okay, let's go to Reverend Griffith John, who was a British missionary living and preaching in China at the time. And he describes his traveling route from Shanghai to Suzhou in the summer of 1860. He says, quote, The towns and villages presented a very sad spectacle. These once flourishing marts are entirely deserted, and thousands of houses are burnt down to the ground. Here and there, a solitary old man or old woman may be seen moving slowly and trembling among the ruins musing and weeping over the terrible desolation that reigns around. Together with such scenes, the number of dead bodies that continually met the eye were indescribably sickening to the heart. End quote. Another perspective, this time from an American in Hangzhou in 1861, talking about his experience of the Taiping Rebellion, saying, quote, the canals were so full of the bodies of those who had committed suicide during the first few days of the reign of terror that those later wishing to end their existence could not find sufficient water in which to drown themselves. Terror-stricken, the people rushed out of the western gates and threw themselves into Westlake such that one could walk out into the lake for a distance of half a li on dead bodies. End quote. By the way, I'm getting these accounts from historian Toby Meyer Fong's excellent book, What Remains, and I'm going to be talking about that book in particular a lot more as this series goes on, but I do want you to notice something about those accounts, and that is simply the apocalyptic tone and the stage being set for the level of destruction that the Taiping Civil War created in China. 
this was chaos and madness for about 14 years. It was a total wasteland on a massive scale. I read three accounts there. We're going to read more accounts as this series goes on. And you could go on and on and on with these accounts, hundreds, thousands, describing similar events. And right now we're trying to set the stage for disease and death and suicide, war, famine, displacement, injustice. The list goes on and on. All of that being said, the story of the Taiping Civil War is a incredibly complicated situation that involves a lot of big picture trends and forces that are mixing together with individual actors in China to create really a unprecedented event in world history, from my perspective at least. I do think that there are some important things to get out of the way first when you're talking about this story, because I think that if you don't understand some of the big picture causes and the larger context of what's going on during the story, it's very easy to get confused and very easy to get lost. So the basic way that the Taiping Civil War story is told is basically the story of one man, Hong Shu Chuan, his essentially creating a religion, a version of Christianity, where he is the younger brother of Jesus Christ, Hong then amassing millions of followers and rebelling against the Qing Empire in China. That is the sort of standard basic version that you may have learned in your AP World History class or in your high school history class. But in reality, the story is a lot more complicated than that. For example, many of you listening may be wondering why I'm referring to this as the Taiping Civil War, when you're probably more familiar with the typical language used, which is the Taiping Rebellion. Historian Stephen Platt, in his book Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, talks about this difference between civil war and rebellion. Saying, quote, I generally prefer to describe this conflict as a civil war, a term used commonly for it at the time, rather than as the more familiar Taiping Rebellion. In writing about this conflict, Western historians have long taken the side of the dynasty, at least in their choice of terminology. The Taiping were indeed rebels, but to call the entire war the Taiping Rebellion is to cast the rebels forever in the wrong and to lay all the blame on them for defying their legitimate rulers and destroying what one might surmise was otherwise a peaceful and stable empire. In going back to the time, however, it is very difficult to distinguish which side was the more destructive and violent, especially in the war's final years. Historians in the People's Republic of China have typically held the opposite bias, treating the Taiping as proto-communist peasant rebels and referring to the war as the Taiping Revolution or the Taiping Uprising. I hope it will become clear to the reader of this book that just as it is unfair to suggest that the Taiping were solely responsible for the devastation of the war, it is likewise an exaggeration to claim they were building some kind of peasant utopia. End quote. To me, this is really interesting because, as historian Stephen Platt is pointing out here, even the way you name something, the terminology that you use, can sometimes couch things in moral terms. And right away, before you even start telling the story or listening to the story or reading the story, you're building in inherent bias simply off of the way things are phrased, or the way things are worded. For me personally, I think that Platt brings up an interesting point here, and I do think calling this a civil war avoids some of those quandaries that he mentioned in that passage. But I do also think that sometimes the emphasis on the terminology and the 
formality of what to call things ultimately isn't that big of a deal because we should be focusing on the experience of the people involved. And it doesn't really matter if we call it a rebellion or a civil war. But it might, and I'm going to refer to it as a civil war as we go forward here. One other thing that I think we should get out of the way before I start getting into the big picture causes of the Taiping Civil War is the issue of pronunciation of a lot of these Chinese nouns. I should say that I'm not a native speaker and I'm not from this part of the world, so the pronunciations can be difficult for me and I'm sure that I'm going to be making some mistakes, and I know this is going to upset a lot of people, but I am putting in an effort, and when I screw up, at least I'll do it consistently. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, as we said earlier, the Taiping Civil War is often told through the lens of this one guy, Hong Xu Chuan, who creates this new version of Christianity, begins this rebellion, and launches this period of chaos and upheaval. And in many ways, this version of the story is interesting, and it's actually true. I think sometimes in modern history, we can actually underrate the impact that one individual can have on the world, and this is something that's going to be the focus of at least one future episode of this series. But we do have to acknowledge that this is not the full story of the Taiping Civil War, and there's lots of big-picture context and trends and situations globally that are setting the stage for the Taiping Rebellion or the Taiping Civil War. Historian Toby Meyer Fong goes over some of the big-picture causes in the decades leading up to 1850 when this Taiping Civil War really gets underway. She says, quote, Trouble had been brewing for some time because of a multifaceted social and political crisis that affected even the Yangtze Delta, a region often described as China's economic and cultural heartland. The empire was afflicted by shrinking government capacity, impoverishment, and natural disasters, compounding during the period 1821 to 1850 by the convergence of population pressure, failing infrastructure, corruption, inflation, and administrative melees. These problems were much discussed at the time by statecraft-minded scholars. Additionally, widespread death and destruction had accompanied floods, epidemics, famine, and earthquakes during the first half of the 19th century. Tensions were further exacerbated by a severe monetary crisis, which intensified during the 1840s and 1850s. The empire depended on a bimetallic monetary system, whereby taxes and other large transactions were paid in silver denominated by weight, while most of the business of daily life was transacted in copper coins. A shortage of silver triggered a sharp rise in prices and an even more dramatic rise in land taxes. Landlords pressured tenants to pay their rents so that they could in turn pay their taxes, along with the host of irregular fees that the bureaucracy had initiated in order to make up for its own shrinking financial resources. Tenants absconded, landholders sold their holdings and departed, those without means turned to banditry. The indemnity imposed by Great Britain in the aftermath of the Opium War placed a heavy burden on the dynasty's already overextended treasury, and the foreign victory challenged both the dynasty's sovereignty and its legitimacy. End quote. That's a long quote with a lot of historian speak there, but I like it because it highlights all or at least most of the big picture historical events and situations that are laying the foundation for the Taiping Civil War. It might be useful to start with this idea of the Qing Dynasty. In Chinese history, there's often these dynasties that rule for centuries at a time, 
and the history books will talk about golden ages, times where the dynasties were strong. And then in other cases, they might talk about dynasties weakening, becoming corrupt or ineffective. There's this concept of the dynastic cycle in China where a new dynasty takes over, it reigns over a period of peace and prosperity. Ultimately, disasters end up striking, people end up dying, natural disasters might hit, fiscal problems, corruption, and then a new dynasty takes its place, and you have this cycle that repeats throughout Chinese history. So if you buy into that idea, this would be a period of weakness. The Qing dynasty was spread thin, its bureaucrats were corrupt in many cases, Bandits and pirates were all over the place, particularly along the Yangtze River area, and particularly around the delta where it meets the ocean. As Toby Meyer Fong pointed out, you have this fiscal crisis that's going on at the time, land-owning issues going on, poor people unable to pay their rents. You also have political corruption added to this and environmental famine, natural disasters as well happening at the time, adding to this stress that is being placed on the Qing dynasty, you have the presence of Westerners in China. I'm going to get a lot more into this in future episodes of this series. I think right now I'm just trying to set the context and the framework. But importantly, the 1800s were sort of the high mark of European imperialism. Maybe we should use the term low mark, but anyway, when we say European imperialism, generally what we're talking about is Western European countries, for example, Britain or France, extending their political and economic control into places in Asia and Africa. The scramble for Africa in the late 1800s comes to mind immediately. The British control of India through the British East India Company, as well as direct and indirect methods of getting what they want out of India, which is profit. And also in China. I'm going to go a lot more into what the British in particular were doing in China what was motivating them, why they were there, and what they wanted, again, in future episodes. But it's important to understand that as far as big picture causes of the Taiping Civil War, British imperialism, and in particular, the opium wars that break out between the Qing dynasty and the British, play a big role. It's important to remember that China is not as self-contained as you might think it is during this period of history. Thousands of foreigners lived there in the 1840s and 1850s. China has been connected on the Silk Road to other civilizations for hundreds, thousands of years. The same thing with maritime trade and global economic markets. So to some extent, the Taiping Civil War needs to be viewed in this global lens, even though ultimately this is a story of the people of China who are most affected, obviously. The Opium Wars from about 1839 to 1842 are probably the classic example of European imperialism in China, and they're a great example of how many times And in many cases, for the Europeans and for the Westerners in China, the stakes can be sometimes high, but ultimately it's mostly an economic situation. If things don't work out the way they want them to in China, the European traders or the European governments acting on behalf of trade interests back home can just take the hit and leave. They can find other markets to go to. They can look elsewhere in the global empire, if you're the British at least, to make up that trade deficit. 
But again, for the people of China who are getting ravaged by this civil war, it's about more than economics. So the basic version of the opium wars is that the British, with their global empire, are bringing opium from the India region of the empire into China. They're selling it there, making huge profits. And for obvious reasons, many in China object to this morally. And they also object socially as they see this as something that's weakening the Chinese people. Furthermore, they see this as destabilizing the Qing dynasty because in many cases the Qing dynasty is powerless to stop this. At a certain point, the Chinese try to stop the trade of opium. They dump a bunch of it into the ocean, similar to the old Boston Tea Party type of deal. This triggers the British, we get war, and ultimately the British come out on top, or at least come out being able to preserve their economic interests with this opium situation. Again, it's more complicated than that, but we need to understand that this is going on in order to understand the broader context of the Taiping Civil War. Another big picture cause or context event that is going on during this period that's related to imperialism is nationalism. One mistake that often gets made when people talk about China in the modern day or China historically is not acknowledging the diversity within China itself. China is an enormous place with a ton of different types of people inside of its borders. So oftentimes I'll hear somebody referring to somebody in China as Chinese, but especially during this time period, there's all sorts of different types of Chinese people. There's different dialects, there's different religions and languages, cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds. And this multi-ethnic, multi-cultural China is going to play a big role in this story, especially during the 1800s, which a lot of people would say at the time people viewed nationalities and nationalism and ethnicity, people viewed much of politics through that lens. Obviously, we're going to get into European racial views and how that impacts this story. But there's also those views that are similar percolating throughout China. Nationalism, race, and ethnicity play a big role in motivating the Taiping Civil War. We're going to get into more of this later, but the big picture is that the Qing Dynasty, which controlled China at the beginning of the Taiping Civil War, was ruled by a group of people known as the Manchus. The Manchus are a minority, ethnically speaking, in China. They come from northern China, a place called Manchuria, and they had conquered the previous Ming dynasty and ruled for a couple hundred years at this point. The Manchus did things a little bit differently from the majority ethnic Han Chinese. The hairstyles were different. The religious attitudes were different. The cultures were different. The geography was different, which sometimes just creates a natural divide. And the leaders of the Taiping in particular were more than happy to drum up this nationalist ethnic sort of difference And it's a big picture idea to keep in mind as we discuss the Taiping Civil War. Many in China viewed the Manchu Qing Dynasty as illegitimate because of this. They viewed them as alien, and they viewed a rebellion to overthrow that government as legitimate. Interestingly, many in China viewed the Taiping Civil War that way, and many outside of China, also viewed it that way. Remember, this is right around the period of the nationalist revolutions of 1848 and the ideals of the Enlightenment and nationalism being present and spread far and wide throughout Europe. 
So public opinion from Westerners, especially at the beginning of this conflict, was very much pro-Taiping in some cases because of this nationalist ethnic view of the world that many had at the time. Although the Qing dynasty was a minority group ruled by Manchus, they co-opted and integrated and streamlined a lot of what was already in place in China. So from a governing perspective, they maintained the classic civil service exam in China. This is a system of bureaucracy that goes back hundreds of years, and it's often described in terms of meritocracy. The idea is that basically anyone in China, all throughout the massive empire, is eligible to take these local exams. Oftentimes they're based around Confucian texts. And based on the results of the exam, you can go to more regional exams. And then if you pass those, you can go to national exams and earn your way into the bureaucracy, ultimately the governing class of China. The Qing are using the civil service exam just like dynasties before them. And in theory and on paper, it sounds great. Meritocracy, only the highest achievers will earn a place in the bureaucracy. But in reality, the highest achievers are going to come from the places with the highest wealth, who have the most money for education, the parents who can pay for tutors for their children. And as a result of wealth inequality, the proportions of who makes it into the bureaucracy are going to be skewed. This seems like a minor detail to be talking about here, but it's going to have big ramifications as we go through the story. Another thing I'll mention here from the perspective of a big picture idea that's influencing the Taiping Civil War is the idea of what we call cultural syncretism. Syncretism is this idea of different cultures, different religions, different societies mixing and matching and creating something new, especially during these ancient periods or proto-modern periods. An example of this idea might be something like Hellenism during the conquest of Alexander the Great where Greek culture was mixing with Persian culture and creating this new Hellenistic culture. Some people have argued that you can see this in architecture, stuff like the Taj Mahal, finding syncretic mixtures of Islam and Hinduism that influence this magnificent building. You could talk about diaspora and trade communities that popped up along the Indian Ocean, mixing all types of religions and peoples together to create something new. And in China, this idea of cultural syncretism is actually a big cause of the Taiping Civil War. As we talked about, this is the high watermark of European imperialism. And as Europeans are in China, worried about trade and the pipeline of Chinese goods from China all the way back to places in Western Europe, they're also bringing with them missionaries. We open this episode with a quote from one of these British missionaries, and their goal is to spread Christianity into China and turn China into a Christian nation. We're going to get into this a lot, but in some ways, the story of the Taiping Rebellion or the Taiping Civil War can be told as simply the story of religious syncretism. What happens when the power of belief overcomes an individual or a society? This mixing of Christianity with classical Chinese culture created something new, and it led to a chain of events that nobody could have anticipated. And this idea of Christianity in China is where we meet another and the final big picture cause, in my view, of the Taiping Civil War, and that's Hong Xuchuan. I'm going to read a short 
passage here from Stephen Platt, historian and author of Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, talking about Hong Shu Chuan's early life. He says, quote, Hong Shu Chuan began studying the Confucian classics at the age of seven. He distinguished himself immediately and in a few years had memorized the four books, the five classics, and the other texts required for the civil service examinations. By his early teens, he had also read widely in Chinese history and literature, and was so bright, his family believed, that he could understand the ancient texts at first reading without assistance. They dreamed that he would restore their long-lost family glory, and several of his teachers worked without pay in hopes that their reward would come when he passed the exams and became an official, as his need for more specialized training took him to schools farther from the village, his family pooled their resources to support him, though by age 16 he was already supporting himself as a school teacher, with a small salary paid primarily in rice, lard, salt, and lamp oil. End quote. We're introduced there to this person who lives in a small area. His parents are farmers. He comes from a people known as the Hakka, and it's kind of a classic story, right? A family, a people are putting their hopes in this person, Hong, who is going to play within the rules of the system and work his way high up to restore prestige and power to this area, this people, this family. And that passage from Stephen Platt also shows how a lot of people in China believed that before the Qing dynasty, they were higher up on the social ladder and that they should be restored to their positions. So much of what is ultimately going to become what's known as the Taiping religion and the Taiping rebellion is based on this idea of anti-Qing, anti-establishment people who are the losers of this society, people who believe their time is now to restore their former glory. Ultimately, this movement is going to be led by Hong. As he continues to pursue the civil service exams, he begins having visions, and he begins sort of having this delusions of grandeur period. He continues failing exams, and eventually he stumbles upon some Christian essays, books, and begins interpreting the visions that he's having through them. We're going to get way more into this in the next part of this series, but eventually this syncretism starts happening, where Hong is now mixing Christian ideas with the ideas of Christian missionaries, which are not always the same thing, believe it or not mixing that stuff with what he knows about Confucianism, mixing that with his local Hakka ethnic tradition. You get this syncretic blend, and a religion starts to take shape. He begins preaching, gathering converts, destroying Confucian temples. It starts out with him gathering his family and friends to the cause. Then he begins to move slowly outward from there just like a pyramid scheme in some ways. The movement over time becomes more political, more ethnic, more anti-Manchu, more anti-Qing. Keep in mind the big picture of political, economic, and social upheaval that's happening in China at the time. And many people in southern China in particular begin to look to this Taiping movement for support as local violence is breaking out. Pirates and bandits and just general bureaucratic dysfunction. Eventually the movement starts to militarize and before you know it, you have a large army in southern China fighting against the Qing who are trying to suppress what is becoming this out-of-hand rebellion. Now hundreds of thousands of people disenfranchised folks from this area of China are flocking to the Taiping, they're abandoning their homes, and the march to Nanjing is on. For 
14 years, China would be ravaged by this civil war, battles, atrocities, politicking, economic posturing, religious upheaval, disease, famine, death, imperialism, Westerners fighting and committing their own atrocities at times in China, trying to influence events to suit them. Ultimately, it's a bizarre and almost too strange to be true story. And I hope in this episode I laid some of the groundwork to understanding the Taiping Civil War. But at the end of the day, I do think it needs to be remembered amidst all of the strangeness of this story that you have the deaths of maybe 20 million people and the social impact of that would last maybe forever. In a illustrated pamphlet created in 1964 by Yu Zhu, who was a bit of a ideological preacher in southern China during this time period, he wrote this pamphlet called Tears for Changnan, talking about his experience of this Taiping War and the experience of his personal community during this war. He said, quote, All of these matters that one cannot bear to see or bear to hear about, things that distress the heart and torment the eyes and that are difficult to write about, what is described as something that would make even a man of iron cry if he were to see it. End quote. It's going to be hard to find a better way to frame the story of the Taiping Civil War than that. <laughs> 